<laughs> a visionary and mystic who has illuminated the path of inner exploration for millions. Introduction, Bala didn't say you're also a drama queen. <laughs> recently hosted Sadhguru in a series of thought-provoking engagements featuring renowned scientists, business leaders and philanthropists. Organized by the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet, the event provided a vibrant platform for meaningful dialogues aimed at advancing human well-being. One of the most anticipated highlights was Sadhguru's meeting with NASA astronaut Sunita Williams. As many will remember, on March 18, 2025, Williams safely returned to Earth after an extended nine-month mission aboard the International Space Station. Originally planned as an eight-day mission beginning June 5, 2024, it was significantly extended due to technical delays with Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. She and fellow astronaut Vach Fillmore ultimately returned aboard a SpaceX Crew-9 capsule, landing safely in the Gulf of Mexico. NASA celebrated their return, noting Williams' crucial contributions to scientific research during her 288-day mission, marking a major milestone in space exploration. In addition to the recent sessions, we will also listen to a conversation where Sadhguru and leading scientists explored the profound question, what is consciousness? The discussion examined the nature of awareness and whether AI systems like ChatGPT could ever attain consciousness, a subject that continues to ignite deep curiosity and debate across the scientific, technological and philosophical communities. Of course, our next explorer is Sadhguru. Official. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go anywhere. A visionary and mystic who has illuminated the path of inner exploration for millions. Introduction, Bala didn't say you're also a drama queen. <laughs> the same questions raise questions of the same expansion into space raise questions of meaning, consciousness, and how we carry our humanity out into the cosmos and into stepping into the unknown. And this conversation comes at a very pivotal moment as we in humanity are investing time and energy developing technologies to go beyond Earth, to the Moon, to explore Mars and beyond. The blue marble, and this is that tiny blue dot. And I take it everywhere I go, on mountains, underwater, everywhere, and Sunny actually honored it by taking this into space. It's a reminder of... <laughs> it's a reminder of not only exploration, but unity and human consciousness, and more importantly, our collective responsibility for protecting our only fragile home. We definitely need a global flag and a global anthem. We are all right from childhood singing our national anthems and national flag, and going on thinking we are other surveillance. Can I get a photo with my space on the crossroads? You know, you, um, uh, you are one of the co-theorists, right, say about the integrated information theory, which is more popular now on consciousness. Can you put it in simple words that most of us can understand? <laughs> in English, they <this>, say. <laughs> can I have the remaining 90 minutes? <laughs> So, so uh, integrated information theory takes a different pro uh, approach. It says, what is the only thing that you know, the only thing that's given to you, the only form of existence is consciousness. 
When I'm not conscious, when I'm deeply asleep or unconscious, I don't exist for myself. So it's really sort of you start with what really exists, which is my consciousness, and then from there you seek to explain the uh, the world, and you, you you seek to explain what is it about the world that gives that, that sort of what is the substrate of 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 this conscious um, uh, experience. So it combines elements of, of of what's called idealism with elements of um, you know, physicalism. It says there's a substrate, in our case it's a brain, it's not the heart as most people thought, it's a brain. And so it says, well, what is it about the brain that that gives rise to um, into consciousness? So it looks for, for particular very um, um, complex, irreducible um, aspects of, re of reality. Ultimately it says anything in the world, anything, not just this, substrate, but any other substrate, including other animals, including possible trees or, or, or bacteria, or maybe even elementary matter, as long as it has some measure of complexity, as long as it is irreducible. So it, it starts with irreducibility, it has some aspect of mind. So it shares some aspect with, uh, with what's called panpsychism, right, with the belief that consciousness is probably much more, there are many more things that are ensouled in the universe than just this, or maybe dogs and cats and and, uh, and great apes. And then it tries to make some prediction, because it's a scientific theory, so it tries to make prediction where does consciousness happen in the, in the human brain or in the brains of other creatures? Can you build a conscious meter? So Stephen Loris this morning talked about a way to test for the presence of consciousness in patients that are unable to communicate, where you don't, where you simply don't know whether they're conscious or not. So you, you know, trying to build a, a, a conscious meter, and it also makes clay, it, it also infers consciousness where it is and where it's not, where it's not present. So, mo most famously, uh, integrated information theory says that that sent, that machines particular large language models like ChatGPT or GPT-4, 3.5 or 4.0, they can, they can do almost everything that we can do. And in, in very few years, they will be able to do everything we can do, but just much better, faster, better, with perfect recall, perfect memory. But they can never be what we are, because they, they, they don't have, if you look at actually where the rubber hits the road, if you look at the physical substrate, it's, it's, it's very simple digital gates doing their thing and, and consciousness is not a computation. The, the technical term is non-algorithmic, it's non-Turing it's non-Turing computable. And so that would say, yes, the, the machines that we are surrounded with, and we live now in the age of intelligent machines and they'll become more and more intelligent with, with unknown consequences for, for our future, but, but, but they're not sentient they're not conscious. So those are some of the implications of uh, integrated Thank information theory. Thank you. So you met Sadhguru last night for the first time. And if, you, if I give you one question that you could ask <laughs> about this consciousness, nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Galileo, so, science. And so I wanted to ask you a question about science and, and, and spirituality. So science is enormously successful. It, it gave up rise to all of this. And, you know, chat GPT and nuclear weapons and mRNA COVID vaccines and all of that good stuff and knowledge about the universe. But it started with Galileo saying, you know, we have to make measurable what's not measurable. If it can't be measured, we don't study it as scientists. And B with Rene Descartes, you know, dividing everything into, you know, into this, these dual domains of the physical and the mental. And by and large, scientists don't worry about the mental because it can't really be measured. And and so, and given that this, and given that this is the case, what do you expect that science can give, and can give all of us? We we obviously suffer in the modern world from enormously mental health. Crisis, right? We, we're living through this time of deep depolarization and crisis. So, what, what is it, given that these are char these characters of science? What is it, if anything, that we can do to help people overcome their suffering? Well, uh, the question is not about consciousness. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the question is about uh, suffering. 
See, well, any… any human being, if you know some suffering, you know only two kinds of suffering, physical suffering, mental suffering. You do not know any other kind of suffering. Am I… am I correct? Hello? Yes. These are only two things. Physical aspect of who we are and the mental structure, both these things you built from within over a period of time. You were not born this way, you were born like this. Some input was there, rest you built over a period of time. By the food that we eat and the impressions that we gather and how we gather and how we eat, of course <laughs> With this we built different kinds of bodies and different kinds of minds. If you build something, let's… Uh, to make it simple, Let's say if you build a machine, the most important thing is it should take instructions from you. If you have a car that if you move the steering this way, it'll go this way, this is a dangerous car. So, now your body and your mind, let me ask you a few simple questions, will you answer me please? Yes. If your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want it? Yes. No, that's only about fifteen, sixteen people. <laughs> the remaining, I'm asking you whether you <laughs> whether you say yes, no, or silence, I'll bless you, all right? <laughs> health, you want it? Yes. yes. Because that big yes has not happened within you, you must know this. It's not you saying yes to me. Every cell in your body must hear you are saying yes to it, yes? yes? If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. Yes. Hey, come on <laughs> If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. Yes. If your emotions be become pleasant, we call this love. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. Yes. If these very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. Yes. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Yes. Only to create pleasantness in our surroundings, we need the cooperation of all these people and many other forces. But to create pleasantness in your body, in your mind, in your emotion and in your energy, is one hundred percent your business. So, your suffering is just that you have not taken charge of this machine. You have not taken charge of your faculties. I'm asking, if your thought and emotion right now happen the way you want, would you create blissfulness or misery? Please tell me. What's your choice? For yourself, what you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but for yourself, highest level of pleasantness, isn't it? Yes. Can I tell you a little joke, is it okay? Yes. Because uh, these things so get so serious, we start suffering <laughs> Conferences can be suffered, you know that <laughs> I have suffered many <laughs> On a certain day, a lady went to sleep. In her sleep, she had a dream. In her dream, she saw a hunk of a man standing there and staring at her. Then he started coming closer, closer, closer and closer, that she could even feel his breath. And she trembled, not in fear <laughs> And then she asked, what will you do to me? He said, well, lady, it's your dream. You can do whatever the hell you want. So right now, it's not even about your life is not happening the way you want, even your dream is not happening the way you want. If your dream was happening the way you want, would you suffer? So, suffering is simply because you have misunderstood your psychological reality as existential. Your psychological drama has become bigger than the cosmos, cosmic drama that's happening. So once you have such a misconception, such a lack of context in the universe, then you must suffer. Hello?
when you misunderstand that you are bigger than the cosmos, you should suffer some, isn't it? That's all it is about. This may sound unempathetic because people are always in this mode, I scratch your back, you scratch my back, both of us are right. So this is the deal between the suffering. But does anybody consciously wants to suffer? No, but too many people are committed to suffering. Too many people are committed to suffering, either they are encouraged by their religious beliefs or they believe that's the only way you will mature, that is the only way you will know. It's a sad conclusion you have made. You tell me or any of the scientists who are here can tell me, this body and this brain works best when it's peaceful and joyful. This is my experience, sir. Is it correct, sir? I don't know who are the brain scientists <laughs> Is it correct? Yes. Your body and your brain works at its best when it's in a pleasant state of experience. How do you think by suffering you will realize something? Somebody is psyching you to believe that because your suffering is their business.